Welcome to Nutrition 101. This course follows Sizer and Whitney's Nutrition, Concepts, and Controversies 16th edition, but I've made adjustments by skipping and arranging some of the material and adding my own images and information. This video covers Chapter 1, Food Choices and Human Health. The learning objectives for this lesson are to define nutrition and describe how food selections impact a person's health, discuss the relationship between nutrition, lifestyle, and genetics with regard to disease risk, identify the six classes of nutrients, and explore the challenges people face in choosing health-promoting foods and beverages. The first thing we're going to do is define nutrition. After all, it's the title of the book we're working from, and it's the overarching theme for most of what's discussed in the next 10 plus chapters. Nutrition is defined as the science of how food nourishes the body. This means we rely on the scientific process and evidence to shape our nutrition knowledge, rather than leaning into unsubstantiated claims and opinions. It also means that when we study nutrition, we're primarily interested in the complex relationship between food and the body. Nevertheless, human behavior is also a fundamental component, particularly what people eat, why they eat it, where they eat it, and who they eat it with. All of these pieces center around diet, which is the foods and beverages a person usually eats or drinks. Whenever you hear me say diet in these videos, I'll be referring to this definition and not an intentional effort to lose weight, which the word has often come to represent. So, nutrition is the science of how food nourishes the body, and within that science of nutrition, there are endless questions to explore. Some common ones that we'll be looking at include the following. Which nutrients does a food contain? What do nutrients do in the body? How much of each nutrient do humans need to consume? and what happens if someone consumes too much or too little of a specific nutrient. When it comes to the complex relationship between food and the body, Sizer and Whitney tell us to think of it as a lifetime of nourishment, while also considering the diet-health connection. These are not terms you'll find in a dictionary or in different textbooks, but is language created by the authors to represent universal concepts in nutrition and health. A lifetime of nourishment describes the ways in which food choices impact a person's health. The two major implications are that food choices have a cumulative effect on the body and that nutritional needs change over time. With a lifetime of nourishment, we accept that how we are fed as babies affects our health and development as children, what we eat as children affects our health and development as we become young adults, and what we eat as young adults has a lasting effect on our adult years. Each stage impacts our later years in life. We also accept that various aspects of our nutritional needs are unique at each stage, such that what we require from food as a baby is vastly different than what we need as an adult. Though not depicted here, I think it's worth noting that nutritional needs vary by sex as well. This means that males and females have slight differences, even if they're the same age, which we'll see more clearly in Chapter 2. The second item, the diet health connection, attaches what we eat to our risk of developing one or more chronic diseases. The CDC defines these diseases as conditions that last one year or more and require ongoing medical attention or limit activities of daily living or both. Examples include cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and osteoporosis. Notably, most chronic diseases cannot be prevented by diet alone. However, our food and beverage choices influence the risk of developing many of them, such that a healthful diet pattern reduces risk and an undesirable diet pattern increases it. Still, other influential factors that must always be considered include genetics, sleep, physical activity, environment, alcohol use, tobacco, drug use, and stress. When we pull up the leading causes of death in the United States, we can see that most of them are linked to diet, with heart disease leading the way. Emphasizing the influence of genetics, we can see that nutrition and genetics play a role in different diseases to varying degrees. On the left end, we have medical conditions that are strictly genetic, such as Down syndrome and hemophilia. Then, as we work our way to the right, the influence of genetics becomes weaker. For instance, a person's genes have a profound influence on their risk of developing osteoporosis and breast cancer, 
Still, there's an opportunity for diet and lifestyle to play a role in reducing that risk. Similarly, if someone has a family history of hypertension or diabetes, then they're at risk of developing it too. Yet, in this case, the ability to influence that risk with diet and lifestyle is even more remarkable than it is with osteoporosis and breast cancer. Finally, as we get to the right side, we have diseases in which genetics play little to no role. Scurvy and beriberi are the outcomes of vitamin deficiencies and are strictly nutritional. The major takeaway from this image is that genes create a blueprint for our health and nutrition influences how many are expressed. One last term I wanted to cover in this section is malnutrition. Unlike a lifetime of nourishment and the diet health connection, this term is found in dictionaries and other textbooks. Malnutrition can be loosely defined as any condition caused by energy or nutrient intake that is excessive or deficient. It includes undernutrition and overnutrition. Examples of undernutrition include starvation and vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Examples of overnutrition include obesity and vitamin and mineral toxicities. All of these can be harmful to health, and so malnutrition must be avoided through the proper planning and execution of a healthful diet pattern. Most cases of malnutrition are preventable, but require sufficient nutrition-related knowledge, diet planning, and access to health-promoting foods and resources, meaning socioeconomic status and access to healthcare are always tied to risk. Malnutrition can occur with any body size or shape. It also cuts through factors like age, sex, and gender. All right, that completes our first two learning objectives. We defined nutrition and described how food selections impact a person's health. We also discussed the relationship between nutrition, lifestyle, and genetics regarding disease risk. Now, we'll go ahead and identify the six classes of nutrients. Nutrients are components of food that are required for the body to function properly. So, each food is made up of different nutrients. We eat food to obtain nutrients and then our body uses those nutrients to support the processes we need to survive and thrive. The six classes of nutrients are carbohydrates, fat, protein, vitamins, minerals, and water. Collectively, carbohydrates, fat, and protein are called macronutrients, meaning they are nutrients needed in large quantities. The vitamins and minerals are called micronutrients, meaning they're needed in small quantities. Even though water is needed in large quantities, it's not typically listed as a macronutrient and is usually found in a separate category. Future chapters are dedicated to each of these classes. Speaking to their importance, most nutrients are considered to be essential nutrients. Essential nutrients must be obtained in the diet because the body cannot produce them on its own, and if the body doesn't receive enough of them, there will be consequences. Still, there are some non-essential nutrients. Non-essential nutrients are those the body can produce enough of on its own. They're found in foods, but failure to reach a certain level of intake is typically inconsequential. Thinking carefully about nutrients, we can see that in a way, you really are what you eat. The six classes of nutrients are all found in different foods, and we must consume them in the appropriate quantities. Otherwise, the body won't be able to function. Zooming in on macronutrients, we see that they are energy-yielding nutrients. That energy is measured in calories, so another way of putting it is that macronutrients are calorie-containing. Carbohydrates, protein, and fat all contain energy in the form of calories. We consume foods and beverages that contain them, and our body is able to extract the energy and use it. The energy the body extracts from them supports bodily functions like blood circulation, breathing, digestion, and physical activity. As I mentioned, the macronutrients are measured in calories to represent energy. However, they're also measured in grams for their weight. Carbohydrates and protein each provide 4 calories per gram, and fat provides 9 calories per gram. 
Alcohol is also energy yielding and provides seven calories per gram, but it's not considered a nutrient because it interferes with the growth and repair of tissues. A diagram like this isn't perfect, yet it serves as an excellent introduction to the macronutrient composition of different foods. We often identify foods by the predominant macronutrient, but most foods contain a mix of macronutrients. Thus, we usually call foods like bread, rice, and pasta carbohydrates, even though they contain small amounts of protein and fat. We also call foods like fish and chicken protein, even though they contain varying levels of fat, and we call foods like avocado fat, even though they contain small amounts of protein and carbohydrates. Some foods, like beans, lentils, nuts, and cheese, have a close enough blend that they get thrown between two macronutrients. Again, this diagram isn't perfect and never will be, but it is instructive and critical to understanding nutrition. Going one step further, we can see how these concepts play out in a product like milk. Whole milk provides a nice blend of all three macronutrients with 8 grams of fat, 12 grams of carbohydrates, and 8 grams of protein in one cup. Using what we learned about the number of calories per gram, we can calculate the total calories provided by multiplying 8 grams of fat by 9 calories per gram, and 12 grams of carbohydrates and 8 grams of protein by 4 calories per gram each. When you add all those results together, the total is 152 calories, which gets rounded to the nearest 10 to keep it simple. Moving on to micronutrients, they support processes in the body but do not provide energy. Put another way, they're calorie free. Micronutrients are needed in smaller amounts than macronutrients, so they're measured in milligrams and micrograms instead of grams. Micronutrients includes the vitamins and minerals. Some vitamins, like vitamin C and vitamin D, are easily recognizable as such because we refer to them in a way that has the word vitamin in it. Other vitamins are more commonly referred to by their scientific names rather than their common names, such as niacin for vitamin B3 and folate for vitamin B9. The minerals only have a scientific name, and many of them, like calcium, sodium, potassium, and iron, are easily recognized by the general public. The significant difference between vitamins and minerals is that vitamins are organic substances, meaning they contain carbon, whereas minerals are inorganic and do not. Vitamins are also made by plants and animals, while minerals are found in the Earth's crust. Coming to the end of this section, one easy way to remember the difference between macronutrients and micronutrients is the car analogy. If the body was a car, as energy yielding nutrients, the macronutrients would be the gas that propels it. The micronutrients are like the oil and coolant. They don't propel the car like gas does, but they help support the processes that make it run smoothly. Okay. That takes care of the third learning objective, identify the six classes of nutrients, leaving us with just one more. Now, we'll explore the challenges people face in choosing health-promoting foods and beverages. For this section, I want you to spend some time answering the following question. What challenges do people face when trying to choose health-promoting foods and beverages? Go ahead and pause the video and write down a few. I hope you took a moment to brainstorm some ideas. There are dozens of directions to take this question, so I can't cover every possible response. But I put down eight different challenges that are pretty common. Examples of challenges I wrote down include availability. That's because many people live in places with limited access to fresh produce or restaurants that offer health-promoting options on the menu. Cost, because fruits, vegetables, and lean proteins tend to be more expensive than convenience foods that are high in saturated fat, sugar, or sodium. Social or cultural traditions, that's because events and gatherings are often centered around highly palatable foods and beverages selected for pleasure rather than health. And personal preferences, tastes, and habits, because it can be challenging to introduce new foods and reduce the intake of others. 
Some other examples include a lack of time or value for nutrition-related activities. That's because menu planning, shopping, cooking, and cleaning are all time-consuming and require significant thought and effort to accomplish week after week. Lack of exposure to nutrition-related information because some people legitimately do not understand which foods are health-promoting and which foods are not because they were never educated on the matter. Information overload because in the digital age, people can be exposed to so many contrasting thoughts and opinions on nutrition that it becomes difficult to know what is accurate. And advertising. That's because food advertisements appeal to our senses and shape our cravings and desires. Building on this discussion of challenges, I want to close out the first lesson by introducing Healthy People 2030, which is a government-led initiative to address Americans' nutrition-related challenges. Put simply, since diet and lifestyle play such a pivotal role in health, it's essential for the United States government and governments worldwide to intervene to maximize the safety and productivity of society. So, Healthy People is a framework that's published by the United States government every 10 years. You can access it online by visiting health.gov slash healthy people. The first edition was published in 1980. We get a new version each decade, meaning that in the 2010s, we were working with Healthy People 2020, and now we're working with Healthy People 2030. In 2030, they'll put out Healthy People 2040. Healthy People sets nutrition and health-related objectives for the upcoming decade. And in Healthy People 2030, the objectives fall under five categories. Those categories are health conditions, health behaviors, population groups, settings and systems, and social determinants of health. The objectives are used to guide policies, programs, and research. Over the decade, progress for each objective is measured. Here are some examples of objectives for Healthy People 2030. Under health conditions, we have reduced the colorectal cancer death rate, increased the proportion of people with diabetes who get diabetes education, and reduced the proportion of children and adolescents with obesity. Under health behaviors, we have reduced the proportion of adults who do no physical activity in their free time, and increased the proportion of adults who get enough sleep. Under social determinants of health, we have reduced household food insecurity and hunger, increased the proportion of adults with broadband internet, and increased the proportion of parents who read to their children at least four days per week. As you can see, health-related issues and challenges are identified, objectives to address those issues and challenges are set, and those objectives are used to guide policies, programs, and research. For example, surveys show that a decent proportion of adults do not engage in physical activity in their free time. Knowing the many health benefits of regular exercise, the government makes reducing the proportion of adults who do no physical activity an objective. Then, policies, programs, and research can be built around it, such as increasing federal, state, or city funding for parks with free exercise equipment. Healthy People starts with gathering information about health-related challenges from various stakeholders. That includes stakeholders from government agencies to community-based organizations and individuals, families, and neighborhoods across America. After that, they identify and sort the objectives based on the number and quality of evidence-based interventions we have for each one and attempt to make them the focus of policy, a program, or research. Finally, as the decade goes on, each objective is evaluated for progress, and all of that feedback is used to shape the creation of the next initiative. The purpose of looking at Healthy People 2030 is not to make you an expert on public policy or the government. Instead, it's to emphasize the diet health connection, the challenges of choosing health-promoting foods, and how they affect us all. That completes all of the learning objectives for this lesson. If you want to check out parts of the chapter that weren't covered, here are the sections I recommend.